behalf of Renewable Energy Systems Canada, otherwise known as RES Canada, I'm here to discuss with you um, and present to you some of the high-level uh, considerations that would involve the Cataraqui Ridge Solar Project that is being proposed, that is, will be proposed into the IESO LRP process next Tuesday, September 1st. Uh, it will be proposed under the registered proponent name of Cataraqui Ridge Solar LP. Uh, a short introduction to Res Canada. Um, I understand that Council and your role here today is to do your due diligence on who wants to do business in your city and who hopes to develop a successful solar power project in your city as well and as harmoniously as possible. Res Canada is, uh, I would like you, I would like to argue, a substantial candidate with significant experience in the renewables field. Uh, this project here that you're looking at is the Taylor Kidd solar project that Res built um, uh, about a year or so ago uh, out in Loyalist Township. We have many more landmarks that we could point to and I'll try to skip but I'll try to pass over them. Um, suffice it to say that Res Canada is a vertically integrated business. We develop, construct, we develop, permit, construct, engineer, and uh, operate our projects um, all under one house, all with them under with the steam and per people power of one organization. Uh, we have an international presence, which has allowed us to accumulate significant uh, renewable energy experience around the world. In North America alone, we're responsible for developing and building some 10% of the renewable energy capacity. Uh, I, I hope that um, these numbers, although I'm flying over them, I hope that they are a testament to the experience that we have in the, and the expertise that we have in-house. Um, uh, we, we have acquired this sort of experience and capacity not by, uh, not by coincidence and not without having uh, earned our stripes and uh, proven ourselves and proven our mettle wherever we do business and having proven that we are a, a good faith and a good partner wherever we go, wherever we operate, and whatever our business is, be it developing projects um, or building them for ourselves or for third-party clients. I'll move on to the project at this point. If you have any more questions, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the Council, Mr. Mayor, I feel, free, feel free to ask, of course. The project itself is the Cataraqui Ridge Solar Project. Um, initially, it comprised of five projects, five, excuse me, five uh, properties. These are highlighted here in yellow. Um, uh, if you can locate yourself, I hope, I hope you have uh, maps before you, but if not, you have um, McAdoo's Lane, which is right about here. And I'll try to open up a map here. Hopefully this works, it does, good. So you have the core properties which are located, located north of McAdoo's Lane here and here. Uh, this, property he this property is 150 acres. The next property is owned by the city of Kingston. To the south of McAdoo's Lane, there are three properties that we have um, interest in. And these properties are um, a 92-acre par parcel here, a parcel here belonging to the Italian Canadian Club of Kingston, and a third parcel here, which is 98 acres. This was the initial proposal to the city. This was the initial proposal to the public. Our project, I should indicate here, um, uh, took pains and made, um, and made efforts to uh, avoid any conflict with especially sensitive areas such as the Cataraqui Conservation Area. From day one, this site, as it was defined according to the rules of the large renewables procurement, uh, was clipped here. So you can see that um, contrary to some misinformation um, and allegations which were made in the media, uh, this, pub, this project never intended and never sought to uh, develop or install infrastructure, panels, what have you, within a, what is obviously uh, an area of significant social interest, environmental interest. 30 we seconds. Be, thank you. Um, this is our project. If you have specific comments on it, please feel free to ask. Um, I will go back to the presentation itself, and I just think at this point that it's important to note that um, at this point, we have offered to eliminate a, sig a significant portion of our project by 98 acres, reducing that and reducing what is effectively uh, the major concern of the city and council 
to, um, uh, to, um, that for fear of eliminating or cutting down trees. Um, I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Councilor Osanek. Thank you very much, um, Your Worship. Um, we appreciate that you're going to be eliminating the 98-acre wooded area from your project. So how many wooded acres um, remain then that will be cut down? Well, at this point, this map that I had here had illust illustrates somewhat, to the best extent possible, using, ge using geospatial data, desktop analysis, the areas that are wooded and the areas that are not. Um, uh, so at this point, you have about, at most, a third of the total pro project area that is wooded at this point. Now, the quality of the wood lot is to be determined, and that will be validated by an arborist as we move through the permitting process. Thanks. So, still a third of the project area. At, at absolute be. most, I should point out here. Um, uh, at absolute most, at, at, at this point, this property here is fully vacant. There are no trees on this property alone. This property here, there is perhaps. Um, in fact, I'd say at this point a quarter, perhaps, um, has trees. Again, I, I hesitate to, to say trees because tree you know, means different things to different people. As for the quality of the tree and the biodiversity and the wildlife habitat that's presented by those trees, uh, at this point, our, our consultants had advised us that there is, in the area that we've defined, very little constraint that would prevent us from a provincial permitting perspective of moving ahead with our project without with any consider without any risk. Thank you. Minimal risk, pardon me. Councillor Candon. Thank you, through your worship. Uh, I was just wondering, what is the general consensus or feedback of the uh, your neighbors or adjacent neighbors on the property? Have you had uh, positive or negative feedback from, from your uh, neighbors? Thank you, Councillor. Um, very fair question, obviously. Um, in this case, the feedback has been quite positive, very positive, in fact. I have had discussions with um, uh, all the landowners next door, um, but one has expressed a disinterest in signing one of the hurdles that we need, which is a letter of support, in order to further advance and improve the odds of this project being um, selected um, uh, under the LRP. More than that, I should add that there are uh, even adjacent residences, um, small property owners, who have no land interest, have no financial interest in the success of this project. And of the three landowners who live within the 200 closest meters, um, two of them have signed letters of support, full stop. Um, and they have, like I said, no vested interest in the success of this project. They appreciate the way we do business. Thank you. You had also mentioned, uh, uh, maybe if you could uh, expand on it, there was you, you had mentioned something about a misrepresentation of some kind that, uh, or a misconception as to uh, something about the project? Mm -hmm. the, the reality is, is that um, because of some mapping that was circulated earlier on, not by Res, but by the city of Kingston, uh, mapping which was, I, I, I imagine, which was supposed to outline and delineate the property boundaries where our projects were situated, that mapping was picked up by certain groups, um, uh, such as Mountain Bike Kingston, which is obviously a vibrant member of the community representing many people. And those members felt threatened by the fact that, by the misunderstanding that our project was going to impose and impede um, and prevent them from doing what they do, cycling around. Um, and, no, and their conclusion was drawn on a fallacious fact, which was that our project, if I can turn back to the map here, um, their conclusions were um, based on the supposition that we were actually going to build out to Burbrook Road over here. Um, and what's even worse, um, uh, the, 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 there was a su supposition that we were actually going to even build into environmentally sensitive area, which was never a possibility because we had defined our site. It had been crystallized in a way such that we could never um, even set foot in this area here. Thank you. Councillor Neal. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions. Uh, as, as I understand it, there was uh, a faux pas when somebody makes a minor mistake. And <laughs> I understand that there was a missing signature that initially staff had recommended your project that was withdrawn because of a document that hadn't been signed. Could you address that? And 
have all documents now been signed and are you familiar with our uh, tree bylaw, for mm -hmm. instance? Mm -hmm. Uh, I can confirm that all documents have been signed, uh, been signed by an officer of Res Canada, and those were signed, and the last one was submitted to the city on uh, August 18th, uh, prior to the Rural Advisory Committee meeting. Um, you know, in developing, you, 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 you reach your highs, and then sometimes you quickly reach your lows. Um, uh, one of my proudest moments not, not that long ago was a presentation to the city of Sudbury where we are recognized for how well we do development and the relationships we build and how flexible we are. In this case, I have obviously uh, let down city staff here, so um, I can't help but you know, extend a mea culpa here. Um, uh, due to personal error on my part, I uh, submitted a document to the city later than it was expected and later than it was required. And as a result of that, the, what had previously been a recommendation in support of our project um, uh, ended up being seen as an act of bad faith um, on, on Rez's part. Um, and there was a lapse, simply a lapse, a personal lapse, a professional lapse on my part. So as a result, that support, a recommendation to support, I should say, was rescinded and an addenda was issued. Uh, so Thank you. And my last Pardon. question, um, as I understand it, there's a portion, um, not a large portion, but a portion of the proposal that is city land. And so it's my understanding that that would generate non-tax revenue to the city. Is that uh, accurate I, summary? I can't comment on the tax, uh, on the on the taxation of city revenues. I, I, I'm guessing by, by what you're suggesting that city revenues that, that come from rents, for example, are tax exempt. So that might be the case. But this property here, which is 13 acres, uh, we have negotiated and concluded, it hasn't been countersigned by the city yet, Res has signed it, uh, an option to lease this property. And from that property, we would be leasing um, uh, the right and we would we would be installing infrastructure on it and paying for the full acreage of the property. Thank you. Councillor Turner. Thank you, Mayor, and through you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it's great. I have a question for you, though. The first picture you showed, um, that was of another site that you have installed within the Kingston area? It's the Taylor that Kidd Wind Farm. And it's an, it wasn't a res development, it was actually a res construction. We engineered it, designed it, built it. The uh, res, as a, is we're, in, we're in a rare position of being not only uh, a provider of services to ourselves, but we also provide services to our competitors on the construction side. And this is a project that we built for a third party. Okay, thank you. Now, I noticed there's a buffer zone around this uh, site. Will there be a nice buffer zone around the new sites that you're proposing? Under the Kingston Siting and Design Guidelines, there is a mandatory 20-meter setback from property mm -hmm. lines and at least 100 meters from residences and homes. Uh, I think it's uh, also 20 meters, I believe, um, from roadways. I should point out that one interesting point of our project is that there will be, while on the south side of McAdoo's Lane, this property here we expect to be as close to the road as the siting guidelines permit. On this property here, there will be no infrastructure visible, no solar panels visible for McAdoo's Lane. So while there will be, um, in fact, we have an interest in providing screening and shading on the north side of this property uh, so that it's less visible or entirely invisible to uh, traffic going through. It is an industrial corridor, so I think there's a certain tolerance uh, for certain less um, uh, beautiful um, uh, landscape items. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions from Council? Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and through you. Um, uh, in the recent communication to Council and the committee, you had indicated um, that you were committed to hiring uh, local labor in terms of uh, providing employment to, on some of the work here. Res being a large organization, do you usually uh, go in and employ the local expertise when you when you hire them? And how can we uh, be sure that you're going to follow up with that uh, commitment? Mm. I, I hope the city does hold our feet to the fire on this point. For me, it's also as as much as development 
interest in the development, a sound development strategy as it is a very sound construction strategy. Uh, we have every interest in hiring locally wherever we can now. The commitments that I can make here won't be, can't be guaranteed at this point. However, the first thing we do when we're developing a project, like any smart developer can and should do if they have the capacity in-house, we have an open house meeting where we recall, where I've called for, for qualifications. And um, on that basis, we will source local vendors and employees to the greatest extent possible. Unfortunately, we're limited by their ability to be competitively priced and skilled. So far as they meet those criteria, we have every interest in sourcing those materials and in labor locally. Happy to discuss that in more detail. I would love to have a way to b bottom that out and have that more concrete. Great, thank you. Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. I just wanted to ask again, so you've already modified your application so that the wooded area or the greater wooded area is completely removed. So that's already been done through not just uh, kind of an email to the city, but actually on the actual application itself, if so, I understand that correctly. Pardon me for interrupting. Yeah. Yes, that is correct. The only way I can modify that at this point is by firstly making a public declaration as I have to the city councillors and to staff that this property is no longer formed a part of our project. Secondly, what we've done is I've excluded two parcels, one being the wooded area and the other being the roadway, um, uh, which, could have been, which could have served as an access route. I've now excluded those from what would be, hopefully, uh, a municipal support resolution. So, in essence, if we are sufficiently fortunate to have a support resolution granted in favor of our project, uh, those two properties would not benefit from it, and if we submitted without that, we would we would be in violation of the of the critical or mandatory rules of the IES OLRP. Okay, thank you. Okay, seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, our second delegation this evening is Charmaine Thompson, Vice President, of Ontario Project Sky Power. We we'll prefer before uh, Council to speak to report number 80 received from the Rural Advisory Committee with respect to Sky Power projects. Uh, I just found that presentation. Oh, is it in here? Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, what I'd like to do is give you an overview of SkyPower very briefly and then walk you through our projects. Um, at SkyPower, you, you've heard a lot about solar developers already, I think, going through materials. Um, what we can bring to the city of Kingston is experience. We have seven operating projects within Ontario. In Kingston itself, we've been discussing these project sites since 2010. Um, they were originally applied for in the FIT program. In 2012, while we waited for the new program to come along, we did discuss with council and with, and with staff the four project sites that we had. In this meeting, you'll have three project sites presented because based on the feedback that we've received over the past three to four years, we've actually consolidated two of our projects to make one. So we're now down to three projects. Um, in 2012, when we first pursued council support and development within the city of Kingston, we understood that you're already in the midst of development with many other developers and a large development in the same area. Based on that, we took a lot of the feedback that we received from staff. We also went to the Unity Road Ratepayers Association as they were the community that was in effect in our area. So we discussed what would we need to do. So in 2012, the only agreement that we had with the City of Kingston that was available to get into uh, a binding agreement was the landscape site design guidelines. So Sky Power agreed to those guidelines and in 2012 actually received council support for all of our projects. This, the guidelines have since changed and we're now in a competitive process. So with that in mind, we spent even more time in the community understanding the Ratepayers Association and the associated landowners in and about the area of our projects. Based on their feedback, we held three community meetings to find out what people wanted to do with our sites. And based on their feedback and the new guidelines, we actually modified our project sites. These are just examples of the ones that we have right now to give you an idea. Um, we modified our project sites to put into place feedback that we received from our landowners and from all of their neighbors. So we took the project sites, we combined two of them, and then we understood the concerns as people live through construction with the Samsung projects that were nearby, what people wanted to see. 
And what they wanted to see was no solar panels right at the roadside. That was the biggest concern. So our project sites, and I'll show you the layouts here, this is one of them. You will notice that, that we are set far back from the road. Tree lines that are in place will remain, so there will be natural visual barriers. In addition, with the city guidelines and the landscape site design guidelines, there will be additional visual mitigation measures put in place. So we have just our distinct light project. It looks like it's the largest one, and the site, the site layout that you see here is conceptual. What we have done is shown the land, and the, where you see the panels is where we want to evaluate the project site. This, pro this land would probably accommodate between 10 and 14 megawatts. We're only proposing seven megawatts on this site because from a desktop perspective, we see that there could be some challenges and mitigation strategies that have to be put in place. So what we've proposed is seven megawatts. So as we do site investigations, we can actually reduce the, the, the coverage of panels on this site so that we can meet the environmental mitigation measures. Our Mist Light Solar Project is our third project and again, set far back from the road. Now, when you look at the the sites all together, you'll notice that the two projects, Classic Light and Mist Light, are actually neighboring to each other. So it's been easier to discuss with the adjacent neighbors their impacts and have the same neighborhood involved in the project. So we've had great feedback. On our Distinct Light project, our biggest concern that we had brought up to us from the community was the neighbor right across the street, who was not an adjacent landowner, but would be almost the most affected, even though she wasn't adjacent. And based on her feedback, we moved the access road for the project off to the side because there was two options of how to access the site. And that way we can address her feedback without, we didn't need the support from the neighbor, but we wanted to be a good community member. That's how we operate. Um, when we came to the city of Kingston and looked for getting into further agreements, at the time it was November last year where we met with your CAO and staff, actually it's one of the councillors that was just leaving. And we discussed getting into development agreements. Now, it took a little while because we did receive the agreements in July, and um, we were very late to the game to sign the agreements and get them back. To go through legal reviews for three projects and three agreements is, is cumbersome sometimes. I can sure you imagine, you can imagine how many levels of approval we have just in a, in a city council. Um, in a business, when you're talking about thousands of dollars and going into 20 year agreements, they will take time in legal review. So we did come to 30, the meeting at 30 seconds. Yes. Okay. 30 seconds. Okay. So all I would like to say is those were late, um, but at the same time they were brought to the meeting, fully signed, and we still have to fill in the blanks and execute those agreements. And in very good faith with the signatures there, we plan on getting that all completed. And we hope that with your support that we can achieve a successful project. Thank you. Are there any questions from Council? <laughs> Councillor Sinek. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you, um, it does say in your application that you're going through um, agricultural lands, heritage resources, possibly, and on-site woodlands. How many acres of woodland are you looking at <laughs> removing? On anything that's on the property line will not be removed because it's a natural visual barrier. Um, within the property lines right now, we haven't noted a significant woodland. So anywhere that you see panels on the conceptual layouts are areas that are not significant woodlands. So upon site investigation, then we can determine what can or can't be removed. For the sites that we have now, there's no major tree removal. Um, the Distinct Light project probably has the most trees, and the quality, the significance of those trees would be evaluated as soon as the contract's awarded. Thanks. So there is no number that you can give us right now? I don't have a number of acres. Um, it's only the one site, Distinct Light, that may have trees, but the quality of those trees right now are not known as significant. Okay. Seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our third delegation is Greg Rossetti Bonfield and Jeff Allen, First Ontario Energy, who appear before Council to speak to report number 80 received from the Rural Advisory Committee with respect to Bonfield NCC Solar LP2. Thank you, uh, Your Worship and Council. Um, we did a presentation last week at the Rural Advisory Committee and we've adjusted a couple of things from there we'll talk about. But one thing that I wanted to comment on uh, Kingston Council is you have become leaders in the province as a municipality with your setbacks and other things and we've advised other municipalities in the province of Ontario to follow your lead. 
We'd also like to be leaders in the industry as developers. We think the project that exists on Unity Road just east of Cordukes today, the developer there should be ashamed. We made a recommendation at your advisory committee that that developer, if they ever come back to this council looking to put a project through here, that you make them fix that project, move the fence back at least 100 feet, put visual berms in and trees to actually make it suitable for the neighborhood. Our intention here is to do visual buffers and build a sanctuary within the solar farm. What does that really mean? Well, there's three targeted species in Ontario that are in trouble. One of them is honeybees, the other one is monarch butterflies, and the other ones are whippoorwill uh, birds. We know that within our within the confines of our fencing, within the fencing of our site, that we can put in the appropriate grasses to help with the whippoorwills. We know that we can put in milkweed for monarch butterflies, and we know that we can put in the different types of clovers, etc., encouraging honeybees. We do want to build a facility just outside the fence, protected, and we do want to work with your local 4-H clubs or your high schools and encourage beekeeping for the area. So what we want to do is emulate your leadership in the province as a municipality that's got it right and we want to be known as the developers that do it right. In other words, you can build sanctuaries within these. There's no reason. You can keep predators outside, you get these endangered species inside. I want to quickly go to a question that came up at Council that we had not really paid a lot of attention to the KMP trail. That was my fault, um, quite frankly. But we did some time out there on Saturday. We spent half a day and we've measured the trail to the western edge of the solar farm. It is 1,012 meters. And on, you can see the trail kind of bends to the north, uh, northwest of Unity Road. And at the top point where the potential solar farm is going to go, those are just property lines, by the way it ends up being 1,000, or sorry, 1,165 meters. We've gone out and walked the trail and looked for those visuals back to the solar site. We parked a vehicle in the driveways of the western edge and you could hardly make out the color of the vehicle. The view from the solar farm to the KMP trail is blocked by many buildings, barns, etc. There are two farms in between that and the uh, KMP trail. We've also provided that we would, uh, as developers, donate $1,000 to the KMP Trail Association if awarded an ISO contract and proceed to construct with the proposal site. We would also like to work with the KMP Association to possibly put up a sign at the KMP Unity Road parking lot location to explain the commitment to wildlife endangered species protection that we are proposing for this solar site. So we do believe that the, the one rebuff that we had on the project was that. We were remiss of it. We've, uh, we've gone out and, and measured it, and the impact is, is next to none. So we're very open to questions on Bonfield. And what I want to say about Bonfield, et cetera, is in order to even be here as an LRP candidate, you had to go through an extensive RFQ process. So anybody that's presenting to you is more than qualified to build these and have a history of building these and the financial wherewithal to bring these to completion in the province. So I'd rather just really talk about the, the location itself. I also was given permission today, we are picking up a document tonight, that we have achieved the ISO requirement that out of 12 abutting properties, we have signed nine abutting support agreements. We have hit the 75% that is required for those points with the ISO. So we're open to questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from Council? Councillor Shell. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Could you describe the buffering that would take place uh, along Cordukes Road? I know that came up quite a bit at the meeting, yeah. please. Yes, we'd like to put um, out towards the western edge and right down Cordukes and right across Unity, anywhere that it can be seen from a road or a residence, a three to four foot topsoil berm and a visual buffering of five to six foot trees, which are a true visual buffering outside of the fence, by the way, so that when you drive down that road, you'll be looking at trees and not the fence and not panels. Mm -hmm. Really, within three years, those things would be 10 to 11 feet tall. And just to follow up, um, do you, uh, is part of your legal commitment to keep the trees healthy and growing, say there were a couple of summers of, of drought, what is your uh, legal commitment in terms of the trees and the buffering? Well, that's in your landscape agreement that we do have to maintain them and keep them alive, not uh, brown and falling down as compared to the other one I'm sure you've noticed up there. Councillor Allen. Um, thank you. Uh, you spoke to the KMP trail 
Um, did you do research on the Rideau Trail, which is also uh, on and, and much closer to the site, actually, um, as it crosses almost uh, directly across from the uh, Cordux Road? And that was something that uh, one of the uh, members of the committee had brought up. Okay, well, I thought he spoke strictly about the KMP Trail, so I'm going to need some help here on where it crosses then, I'm sorry. Um, so, are you able to zoom in on your... So, the, the Rito Trail isn't as uh, maintained as a KMP Trail. Uh, but it is a uh, heritage trail that travels through the property. Um, it, uh, it comes down, uh, yeah, pretty much directly across from Cordux Road there. So very close to the uh, western edge of your northern property. And then it goes along Unity Road and just near the eastern edge of your property, it crosses a field just before the quarry uh, and connects up with the KMP trail and follows along the KMP trail for a, a brief piece. So um, that trail, I believe, follows a bit of a farm track and uh, cuts through some fields with uh, some berms, but it is a listed heritage trail here in Kingston and is part of um, our trails that are looked after. Well, I'm not obviously familiar with that trail. We concentrate on the KMP. I mean, the part that crosses the property there is the hydro right away. Is it near there or is it east or west? I mean, the gravel pit is right to the right of the tower line. So, I mean, we can go back and forth on this for half an hour. I think we should just say that the question's been asked and um, we're not, if, if that's the answer, if there's anything else you want to provide, that's fine, but I think we'll have to Obviously, we'd like to, to buffer it if we if we do. Um, we've we've offered to buffer everything else, so there's no question. Okay, Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I'm actually in, intrigued by when you speak about the bees and and the whippoorwills and everything that you guys have looked at, kind of different things in this area that are you know possibly species at risk and everything. I guess my question is, I, I think that that's a that's a really great kind of above and beyond what some developers have offered, but in past projects, um, what, what have you done similar to that? Or is this something that you're kind of just proposing for the first time in Kingston? Yeah, I'll speak to that. Uh, in, with past projects, uh, what we've seen a lot of developers do and the ones that we've been involved with from a construction standpoint is it's uh, simply matching certain vegetation in the area. What we're looking at is uh, in our comments and our, in our own personal feedback with respect to how the projects have been developed is to take a hard look at that and work with the local community in the, uh, and, and see how you can improve the environment inside that chain link fence, so to speak. And there's absolutely no reason when we started having these types of discussions from a development standpoint, from an economic standpoint, it really makes no difference uh, whether we plant uh, clover or any type of seed mix. But if we can be intelligent about that, and have an additional benefit, why wouldn't we? So there's really no uh, economic impact to it, or at, at best what I've seen is it's very, very modest, and uh, I, I don't see why we wouldn't do that. It just makes good sense, quite honestly. Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just building on that a bit, so we have the road and then set back, right? The berm and there's trees on top of the berm and then it'll be your chain, your um, barbed wire fence. So then before the solar panels start, how wide a buffer are you thinking for the milkweed and the clover? So in terms of a buffer for what you're talking about in terms of the vegetation that would cover the area, that... The vegetation for the bees and the, yeah. the birds. Well, there's no reason why the entirety of the farm couldn't be covered by that vegetation. So typically what you have is 10, 11 meter spacing of these panels. So everything in between the rows can be vegetated uh, with different types of pollinating, uh, low growth. All you really care about from a solar standpoint is not having something in front of those panels that's five, six feet tall and prevents the panels from doing what they need to do. 
So it's just a, a symbiotic type arrangement where the panels are able to do what they need to do and the growth that you, uh, uh, that you strive for within the interior of the farm is something that has a tangential benefit to the environment. Uh, so again, it's, uh, it's not challenging or difficult to do, it just needs to get done. And one further question, most of, because you know, maybe there are some that are like that right now, but most solar farms are built with just gravel in between the solar panels, aren't they? Those are the ones that I've seen in this area. Well, the, the ones that we've done, uh, there's some interior maintenance type roads that are typically gravel roadways uh, that occupy a limited amount of, uh, from a top view, a limited amount of surface area. The balance of the farm uh, is, uh, is vegetated, it's planted. Are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. So uh, I am aware that there are uh, some other delegation requests to come forward. So at this time, I'll entertain any motions from council to add uh, additional delegations. So Councillor Neal, I see, you, see your hand. Thank you very much. Um, I've already passed this on to the clerks. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Holland, that clauses 11.4 and 11.5 of the City of Kingston procedural bylaw 2010-1 as amended be waived in order to allow a delegation of Ms. Ms. Lisa Asperuk, and I apologize for the mispronunciation, of SWITCH to speak to report number 80 received from the Rural Advisory Committee Clause 1, the request of municipal council support under the large renewable procurement for the Cataraqui Ridge Solar Project. Okay, so we have a motion moved and duly seconded to add a fourth delegation. So we will call the vote, and just a reminder to Council that it's a two-third vote to pass. Please vote. And that carries. Are there any other delegations to add? Councillor Bowman. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Allen, that clauses 11.4 and 11.5 of the City of Kingston Procedural Bylaw 20-10-1, as amended, be waived in order to allow a delegation from Mr. Neil Watlington of Next Era Energy to speak to report number 80, received from the Rural Advisory Committee Clause 6, the request for the Municipal Council support under the larger room of procurement for the Corduc Solar LP project. Thank you. Okay. So we will call the vote. Please vote. And that carries. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I, um, I'd like to ask that clauses 11, uh, sorry, motion uh, by myself and seconded by Councillor Candon, uh, that clauses 11.4 and 11.5 of the City of Kingston Procedural Bylaw 2010-1 as amended be waived in order to allow a delegation from Susan Babcock to speak to the requests for municipal council support under the large renewable procurement. Okay, and that is for the Sky Power project, is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. okay, please vote. And that carries. Last call for delegations, Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, this motion is also by myself, and, but seconded by Councillor Bohm, and it's that clauses 11.4 and 11.5 of the City of Kingston Procedural Bylaw 2010-1, as amended, be waived in order to uh, allow a delegation from uh, George Sutherland, uh, Chair of the Rural Advisory Committee, to speak to uh, the report, uh, Report 80 from the Rural Advisory Committee uh, in general. Okay, so this is a little unusual. We don't normally allow for delegations from committee chairs to speak to an overall report. 
Um, but essentially what we're really doing then is waiving our procedural bylaw, which would take a two-third vote anyways. So we'll allow the vote. Uh, this is to add uh, Mr. Sutherland for an additional delegation. So we'll call the question. And that carries. Okay, so coming back to uh, my list. So our fourth delegation will be Lisa Asbrook, uh, who will speak to council concerning the Cataraqui Ridge solar project. Ms. Asbrook. Hi, thank you for allowing me to speak here tonight. Um, I just do have one procedural point because there was some confusion earlier today. Our comments pertain to each project. Is that still okay? So we'll say that you're listed to speak to the Cataraqui Ridge project, but if you make comments on additional projects, then I will not rule you out of order. Okay, and we'll keep within the timeline. So my name is Lisa Asbrook. I live and work here in the community, and I'm a uh, member of the board of directors of SWITCH. It's a member-based organization that represents uh, about 150 uh, local, small, medium-sized, and large businesses, utilities, institutions, and interested citizens in our community that are participating in networking and constructive uh, ideas and solutions towards a cleaner energy transition and cleaner energy uh, future. We are integrated in some of our work with Sustainable Kingston, although there's not complete overlap, but we share some views on the opportunities for our region that clean energy presents. In my professional life, I'm a, a business lawyer, and I've lived and worked across Canada, and I've done almost nothing but renewable energy development for the last 10 years. I'm not representing anyone here tonight. I'm here in my personal capacity and my volunteer capacity as a board member of SWITCH. I wanted to add some context to what's going on for information purposes so people can make the best decision for the citizens of the community. Right now in Ontario, there's a bit of a race going on in the LRP1 process for large procurement across the province. There's only 140 megawatts that are going to be awarded in this competitive process there's probably thousands of megawatts chasing that. We have a unique opportunity in this community. There's a lot of interest from developers, uh, very credible, experienced, and capable of developers in my experience. I don't say that about all of them. But the ones in this room and the ones that have pre-qualified in Ontario are here. They want to do business here. I um, am concerned because I know that there's probably over a billion dollars worth of investment looking at our region right now. There is transmission capacity in our region. There is good soil drainage and uh, bedrock conditions which make us comparably favorable for solar. Uh, there is marginal agricultural land and there are very willing landowner hosts. Uh, I have the, the good opportunity to talk to a lot of them personally, them and their families. And I can't tell you how important and dependent some of these projects and the financial opportunities that they present are to those landowners. Uh, there's a lot of money watching the decision being made here tonight. I, I will allow you to make the best decision, but you should know that just my back of the napkin math estimates that the projects on this list, even after that one dropped off, the six projects remaining are probably somewhere around $400 million in investment here tonight. Um, to be spent in our area. Now, I know not all those dollars will be spent in our area, but my understanding on most, from what I'm seeing right now in project development, project finance, about 70% of budgets typically are being spent on construction. A lot of that is being spent in our region. And then on top of that, you have option payments, lease payments, project area payments, and procurement to local small businesses. Um, these are big dollars. These are tens of millions of dollars at a minimum that are going to stay in the community, probably more than that. Um, and if you look at the region on whole, that number gets a lot bigger. I am personally aware of more than $500 million of project development, economic development, that has already walked, that has already decided not to pursue because of mixed signals from uh, local municipalities, and that's not just attributable here, but in the region. Uh, it's concerning 
for those of us that are trying to assist with economic development. Again, I don't act for any of the developers here today. I'm just saying this objectively. In terms of economic development strategy and uh, the need to attract growth sectors, solar is a growth sector globally. I could go on and on with statistics. Um, it's a growth sector in Canada. It's, the, it's got the attention of provincial and federal platform discussions. It's here to stay. It, it is a growth sector. It does present a real investment opportunity, and I think it's a real opportunity for our region to maximize the natural attributes we have here and contribute in a meaningful way to our own economic development, our own job growth, our own opportunity for the graduates that are coming out of St. Lawrence College in Queens that are inundating those of us in the sector that want to stay and work in the sector, and the landowners that want to stay and continue to farm in a mixed traditional way but need extra income. 30 and, seconds. Yeah, and who want to create basically a legacy for their own children and grandchildren as well to be able to maintain property in the area. Tyson Champagne, many of you know Tyson. He's here today. We weren't sure if we were both allowed to speak or not, but he, I would welcome the opportunity for him to speak if you would. Tyson is the executive director of SWITCH and can talk about the work we're doing as an organization to try and steer developers towards appropriate development, which is responsive to the conditions you need around buffering and is responsive to the needs in this community to make projects work for everyone. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Councillor Osanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks for your delegation. I saw in your letter to us, um, you know, that you definitely highlighted the environmental benefits and economic benefits, and you just spoke about buffering. What switches opinion on the loss of wildlife habitat, our wetlands and our woodlands that go in projects like this? Um, I think, I personally grew up on a farm and I'm really close to some of these agricultural issues. I think that uh, what I know from talking to some of the landowners and walking some of these sites, the agricultural land is marginal on many of them. There's significant drainage issues. Some of them they're taking like one cut of hay off. Some of them they're not even pasturing. Um, in terms of the tree cover, it's very site specific, the answer to that. So you have to get to the granularity of the consultants reports or actually go walk the property to know for sure but they're not developing in wetlands and the uh, mature trees for the landowners I talk to, I mean, the landowners are kind of happy because if they cut down some mature trees, they'll sell it for wire firewood. So it's a source of income for them. But most of the trees are what I consider like slash land. Again, I'm not the authority on that, but I do know from the sites I've seen, it's, it's a lot of just shrub type trees, like low, low trees, not big mature hardwood. Um, I spoke to the loss of wildlife habitat and woodlands, but I, I didn't say so, agricultural. So we'll take, that as, your, your no, no, we'll take that as your second question, as a redo, if you want, because you, you are allowed two questions. Do you want to ask the question again? Um, my second question was, if you have gone up Westbrook Road, Unity Road, and um, Mud Lake Road, and seen what's happened there. Yeah, I don't like to comment on poor development because my whole life and career has been dedicated to working on good projects. And when I negotiate agreements and when I advise anyone involved, landowners, neighbors, developers, anyone, there has to be appropriate buffers. I, there has to be appropriate buffers, and that's probably the relevant conversation here tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Neal. Thank you. I'm just curious from your business background and your environmental background. Um, what we have before Council today is one out of five proposals with a recommendation going forward. The only recommendation going forward before us right now is uh, in fact one that's on our city property. Um, could you tell me what message we might be giving the development community or what message we may be inadvertently uh, sending to the green energy sector if we move ahead with the proposal as written? Um, I, I don't want to comment on whether people will think that's a conflict or not. I don't, I don't know. Um, what I do know is that if a project has met the requirements of the four corners of the law, 
And these are all credible developers that's already been established. And if the project meets the process that's been set by city staff, I understand some stuff was late. Again, uh, some that's, that's a technical problem, but not one that can't be overcome or waived. So if the substantive requirements are met, then I, I think if we're not sending a consistent message that once you meet the substantive requirements and you do sign the agreements in good faith, if you're turning development away at that point, based on, I realize there's some concerns, those concerns need to be addressed, but after you've conditioned and mitigated to, to do those, I don't understand and I don't think the business community and the community that's willing to deploy hundreds of millions of dollars of capital is going to understand a basis for rejection after that. Thank you. Councillor McLaren. Thank you. You had mentioned there's 400 million in investment and 70% goes to construction and the other 30 for other things. May I ask, in your opinion, how much of that money will actually stay in the community as opposed to going somewhere else? Like, uh, how much of that construction of that 400 million will be paid into labor that's local to uh, commodities that are bought here locally and produced here locally it's really difficult for me to say because the project budgets are confidential but on average based on what i've seen um, a significant portion of the construction costs could stay in the community if those skills and talents are available i work with i'm aware of some companies and some people in my family and my friends that work in the trades and i do know that there's quite a few trades in East Ontario, trades people working on solar projects right now. Um, so there is a lot of hiring locally, and I do personally know from projects where they've had to billet construction workers in from other provinces or other places, that's not cheaper. So I assume they're telling the truth when they tell you they're gonna try to hire local first, and it'll depend on who applies for the jobs. Um, and I do know that those are well-paying trade jobs that trades people want. Um, I do know that depending on the landowner and the size of their parcel and how many panels are gonna be on their land, it could be tens of thousands of dollars a year, it could be over $100,000 a year in rent, depend, depending on the project and how much is actually installed on the site. We are talking about significant amounts of money, especially over the term of a contract, and I could go on and on on an individual basis. I don't know the total, but I do know the types of payments and the type of people that are receiving those payments are the type of people that spend that money in the community. Councillor Turner. Thank you. Your worship been through you. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was very informative. Um, I think as a city moving forward, if we want to be innovative, we have to cut the red tape and we have to open our doors and tell people we're open for business and we want to welcome development. We want to welcome ingenuity and creativity. Um, so very interesting proposal that you presented tonight. But my question is, you were you mentioned something about buffers and you had some interesting information to present to us tonight about buffers? That's my question. Yeah, I agree with the comments made earlier tonight that Kingston is uh, known and has a reputation in the Canadian market, not just Ontario, but the market across Canada for solar as having been a thought leader on buffers. And I think we should, we should uh, deploy what we've already done and what we already require. And if more needs to be done on a site-specific view somewhere, the solutions to this are easy. Like, to, in my view, the solutions to this are very simple, very easy, very affordable, and there are no reason to reject a project. If there is a specific site or a specific site line that is of concern that people don't want to see the project, there's very little reason today, unless you have a, a big valley or something, there's very little reason today um, that that couldn't be uh, conditioned in and accommodated. And I also, I hear all the time from the silent majority in the field I work in, the silent majority of people love seeing them. And that, that's a reality. The silent majority driving down the highway or whatever are not here tonight. Councillor Candon. Thank you, uh, through you, Your Worship. I guess as a follow-up to uh, Councillor McLaren's question, I, I, I think we could ask a million questions with regards to the economics behind it. Obviously, we know there's a lot of money that's gonna be spent on these projects. A uh, staggering amount, and I, I feel like a lot of the conversation that we've had. Uh, so, so we're just going to try to limit commentary to okay. get right to. I guess, I guess, the, I guess my question would be: there's there's a huge economic component to this. How do we 
Um, how do we hone in on, on that uh, conversation? Because a lot of the conversation seems to be with neighbors, which I strongly encourage. Obviously, I, I think we absolutely need that. But there's another conversation that may have flown under the radar, the, the economics behind it. Can you expand on that? Yeah, um, I'd be happy to talk to people. It's a longer conversation. I don't have the answers here tonight, but it's certainly something that's been on my mind a lot in the last year. And that is how do you compel, how do you legally require a certain minimum amount of recruitment for jobs in the area? It's particularly the construction phase, particularly construction. I think you're gonna have a hard time attracting or requiring money be spent on procurement because um, besides the construction, the actual site clearance and installation work, the big spend on these projects is uh, modules and inverters. And th those are just realistically not coming locally because we're not in a position to provide them. And they're procured on massive levels, so we're not, we're not in that game. But we are in the construction and trades game. We are in the land clearance game. Uh, also, when you look at things like stormwater management, uh, site engineering, we have very competent local firms, even, uh, even different kinds of environmental firms that are very capable of doing that work. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. And through you, um, you've spoken a fair bit about the, imp the signals being sent in terms of the economic development or Kingston's economic development and the future of renewables. Um, could you just maybe give us a, a brief outline of the, what your opinion is on the signals being sent in terms of our uh, uh, environmental policies, the, the, the letter references the Sustainable Kingston. Um, so just a bit more information on what you think the impacts of that would be of some of these decisions. Yeah, I think um, it's hard, right? Because these are all in very intangible concepts. But I think the, 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 the thought leadership is here. The strategic direction is here. It's, it's in so many documents, you know, whether it's the CAGCO documents, Sustainable Kingston documents, the Directors of the Council, the strategic plan. All of the signals are here that we want to participate in a, in a clean tech and a green energy economy, and we want to grow those sector. I am strained to think of a more clear intersection where we're going to have to make some choices because when this much capital, this capital doesn't exist in Kingston to do what we want to do as a community to build this kind of infrastructure and, and, and transition to a more sustainable, cleaner, greener city. We don't have that capital here on mass to do that on mass. So we do on an on individual basis. But when you have massive amounts of capital that want to come in and mobilize and do utility scale projects, we're going to have to work with the proponents that are willing to make that spend. We have to. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you. And thank you for your presentation and answering all of our questions where this is something that we're all going to have to have conversations about moving forward, so thank you for being here. I have a couple quick questions. First one is, um, you mentioned that uh, there are people who are, or investors who are avoiding Kingston or looking at Kingston now because of uh, the mixed signals that we're sending. Are there, uh, can you give us an example of a community that is uh, saying, please come here, uh, we want it, we want this, and uh, this is how we want it. Uh, I, I have yet, I haven't come across one yet, and so if you work in this, so you might be able to help me find that. Yeah, absolutely, all across Ontario, everywhere. Um, and it's, but it's always site specific, and it always is qualified by, depends on the location, depends on the proposal, depends on the proponent. And it's, it's, and you guys are bang on tonight in saying, you know, we have to consider each one of these projects on a project specific basis. There, there's, it's not a carte blanche decision to come and, and plant utility scale projects in our community. It's a project by project decision, but I know most municipalities in Ontario want and welcome good applications. I, it would be better to ask the developers actually in the room, they're closer to it than I am, but there are a lot of LRP projects right now proposed in Ontario, and I do know from phone calls that I'd received from people in the industry over the last week or so that a lot of these companies are going to their boards of directors today, tomorrow, Friday, because their applications are due September 1st, and those boards will be making decisions about what horses they want to put in the race and submit. And that's really going to depend a lot on what municipal support came through in the end. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm aware of 119 participating yeah. in the LRP project uh, across Ontario. The, um, 
And the last question is, um, sort of moving forward from today's conversation, how, since this process exists outside of our normal planning practices, how can our community uh, plan uh, or this in a way that helps benefit the community? Because at the moment, we're asking ourselves questions like, should these all be in one part of our community or should they be shared across our community? What, uh, you know, what makes it easier for us to plan as a community for these projects? Because at the moment, um, it, it, it's hard to just say yes to everything when we're not quite sure what the result of saying yes to these is going to, to be. So I'm, I'm looking for um, ways forward for our community and at, with your experience you might be able to give us some hints. Yeah, I think your four required agreements are a good start and city staff have the expertise and they can speak to that. I mean city staff with council's direction established those as criteria. Those agreements contain very real, very real requirements and very real long-term financial commitments from all the developers and I think as a council that that direction and oversight to staff has already been provided. Staff go out and do their job and they get those those legal agreements negotiated and signed and if they're all complete I think that's your answer right and there might be more in the future it's an ongoing evolving sector and there's learning experiences and there might be other opportunities for other legal agreements at some point but I can say Kingston's got a decent process we have decent requirements we do have thought leadership here and also if you just looked at what has happened in Ontario since around 2005 2006 when there was a procurement a generation size supply side crisis in Ontario to where we are today the, the, the programs have evolved and it started with the Ontario Power Authority and now the ISO it's evolved they procured a whole bunch of renewables in Ontario under RESOP those are mostly the big wind farms that are located along the Great Lakes um, you saw it in Wolf Island also then you saw the FIT program, early days, high prices, a lot of kinks to work out. This is the third generation in, in recent history of renewable procurement in Ontario, and we've come a long way in 10 years. And a lot of the issues that happened in RESOP and FIT 1, including the pushback on prices, and including issues around maybe bad development, maybe site issues, maybe short, like, you know, not great enough buffers, those kinks have been worked out. And what's happened with this third generation is it's a much more sophisticated, much more mature, much more careful and qualified procurement, massive tender process going on. So you're already working within more checks and balances than you have before. And then you're working with your own internal criteria that I, I, I believe have been met, but I would let city staff speak to that. I don't know for sure. Are there any other questions from Council? Seeing none, thank you very much. Our next delegation this evening is uh, Neil Watlington, who will speak to Council concerning the Cordukes Solar Project. Um, thank you, and uh, we appreciate Council um, taking this uh, exception so that we could present our project. Let me see if, um, is it, is the project here somewhere? Okay, thank you. Um, as I, try to get in your shoes and, and try to think about what are, what are the important things. Um, and, and I think the, the person, the representative from Switch did a very good job kind of explaining a global context. But what, what would I be looking for in these projects and in this process? And one of them would be, right, is it in line with the policies? And, and it seems like the solar projects would certainly be in line with, with Kingston sustainable policies. Um, is, is the company that's sponsoring this project able to meet its commitment? Is it solid financially? Does it have a track record um, of performance? Can it offer continuity in the obligations that it's undertaken? Um, are the projects reasonably sized? Um, 
in areas of known industry or, or with uh, the flavor of the industry in the area and with reputable um, operations and a track record of that. And that the project itself has a high probability of success. As it was spoken previously, we, we have about 12 times oversubscribed um, competition that will, that will be ongoing September 1st. So of all the projects that are here, maybe one could be selected, maybe none at all, because several projects, just one or two projects in the province can take the whole, can take the whole competition. So what I'm here to submit to you is that Nextera Energy, which has two projects um, in the region, but we're not seeking support for one of them. We're only seeking support for the Corduke Solar Project, which is actually on Westbrook Road, not, not on Corduke's Road. Um, is that long term, this is a company that would be a strong corporate neighbor and tenant. This is one of the largest energy companies in North America and one of the largest and premier clean energy companies in North America. Um, and we have operations in Canada, um, in, in both solar and in wind energy. We are they were recognized in the industry as, as, a, as a leader. Um, and that's your sponsor for a, comp for, for a project that will last 20 to 25 years of operations under you know, at least a 20 year contract. As far as the project is concerned, when we um, started interacting with the, with the city of Kingston, they provided us, which again, thought leaders in this, um, you know, a set, a set um, number of documents that would set the stage for compliance with what the city policies are. And we take that seriously and we evaluated all those documents. Um, and as you can see, in, in, in the site will significantly shrink somewhat, even though the site is large enough that it can, it can take um, the setbacks from the city and accommodate them in a way that it would provide significant buffering um, from, from the neighbors. It's a modestly sized project. It's not a massively sized project. It's not small either. Take up about 100 acres, some 25 megawatts of capacity. Um, the project footprint has been is significantly reduced and smaller than what the site itself is. And even though there are some neighbors that have expressed concern with the projects, and we're, we're we, you know, we're trying to work with them, and we'll continue to work with them, it has achieved the large renewable procurements. Um, I think mandate or goal of at least 75% of those landowners, given that one landowner is, is one of the larger presence in the area. We offered to increase the community vibrancy agreement from the $2,700 that was the standard to $3,500 a megawatt. And the, the staff mentioned in the rural committee meeting that had some of the documents um, been submitted on time, they would have likely um, supported um, or recommended support for the project. Um, so looking back in, into what we're trying to do for the long term um, and, and not the, the things that have happened maybe in the short term, you know, Nextera Energy will offer seamless continuity through the development, permitting, and construction of the operations. We are not a company that's into getting a contract and then flipping it around to, to somebody else. Um, it's a large organization or strong financial um, commitments. And the two, it was a two day delay on the documentation that was provided. It was really on the financial documents. So we submitted and signed three of the required documents and the other three came in a little bit late. Those were the ones with financial commitments. And again, it's a large company. There was a, a legal compliance process and so it took longer than we would have liked, but again, it's because we take our commitments seriously that we took a look at those documents and, and, and it took a little bit more time, but they've all, they were all submitted seven days in advance of the committee hearing and you know two weeks in advance of this meeting. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. I'm just uh, curious about the location. Um, a lot of the feedback that we've been receiving from residents and around the area has to do with the fact that many are suffering fatigue from existing 
um, solar projects and the impact that they've had. Are there, do you have any ways of addressing those concerns that you can tell us about? I mean, honestly, I think the, the city documents, the, the roads use agreement and the, um, the, the landscape design guidelines um, are very good in offering certain comfort that there will be significant buffering on, on the sides of the properties. Um, for example, in Westbrook Road, um, if it, we would have 300 feet, you know, football fields worth of a green belt mandated by, by, by the landscape design guidelines. Um, and that's, that's quite a lot of, uh, of buffering and it, it's, it's reflected in the, in the project design. Actually, I should have been clearer, sorry about that. Um, it had, my concern, I guess, or uh, on behalf of some residents, the concern is, has a lot to do with the construction phase, noise, hours of work, that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, I mean, we can certainly work with the city and with the community to try to mitigate uh, the activity during construction. It's something that we, we do um, often. Um, and again, one of the advantages of dealing with a company that's gonna be there from the beginning all the way un until the end um, of, of, of the project term. Uh, we understand that our neighbors are gonna be our neighbors for 20 years or more. And so we need to work with them and to work with the city who's gonna be our host for those 20 years. Councilor Shell. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Uh, did I hear you say that you had the 75% compliance or agreement from the neighbors? Yes, we did. And that basically you have one very large landowner, but are there some others? Um, yeah, I think one or two, I think we had six adjacent, and again, adjacent landowner is a um, large renewable procurement defined term. Um, so we have five of the six um, signed up. Of course, one of them is, is the large landowner. Yeah. Councilor Neal. Yes, um, I guess my concern, and perhaps you could speak to this, and I know that the city has good buffering and, and mitigation policies. But it appears that in the general Westbrook area, we really are saturating uh, the community with green energy. And uh, so I guess I need a little bit of convincing. In what ways will you be mitigating for the fact that already there's a very large footprint in the general area of, uh, through Samsung, of renewable energy yeah. uh, in that immediate community. Sure, I mean, I think we, we can, let's take a look at the two like large faces of the project. One would be construction, where there's a lot, lot of activity, but relatively short amount of time. We're talking about, you know, six months or something of that nature. Lots of activity, we can certainly work on you know, traffic flows on making sure that there's dust suppression and the standard things that you would do to try to mitigate the the disturbance that acti that, that type of activity could do. Um, on a long-term basis, it's it's about the project. Um, where where is it sited? Is there a visual buffering? Um, is it some some is going to be interrupting somebody's life in in some way? Um, again, I think the site is a fairly large site for the amount of megawatts that we're gonna get out of it. Um, so we have a relatively small footprint. Not sm it's not small, but it's comfortable within the site boundaries that we can easily adopt the city's landscape um, design criteria, maybe even go further than that, depending on, on, on the concerns that we have there to mitigate the visual aspect, the, the, the vehicular aspect, um, or any impact of that nature. And, and so if, if you look at the area and, and, you have, and you figure a football field's worth from the road um, will be left intact, um, again, it's, it's a fairly good neighbor for the next 20 years in terms of minimal activity um, and performance. In my second question, if I might, um, are you comfortable or willing to accept that uh, the site plan agreement where a lot of the nitty gritty gets determined in, in planning uh, could very well be a public process with some public input? Are you comfortable with that as a process? Yeah, sure, sure, okay. absolutely. Thank you. 
Okay, seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next delegation is Susan Babcock, who will speak to Council concerning the Sky Power Solar Project. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I will make one small correction. <laughs> Councillor Allen keeps referring to me as Susan, but it's actually Sarah Babcock, oh, which my was apologies. right when, okay. <laughs> Sarah. Was, it was right Sarah when Babcock. we first put it up. So, <laughs> okay. so I want to thank you for allowing me to take this opportunity to speak to you um, on behalf of Sky Power, um, in, on behalf of the community as well as the landowners. Um, we have definitely lived through the construction on Unity Road, and I can completely understand everyone's dilemma or the community's um, resistance to maybe adding any more to the Unity Road um, construction that we've had. Um, we, um, I've continued to run a small business and everything through it, so I totally understand um, people's concern. But with the projects that Sky Power is looking to um, develop on Unity Road especially, those are the two projects out of the three that they are um, offering to develop. Um, there are so many bonuses or positives to those projects alone that are right across from, as everyone says, the largest in Ontario that, so, that Samsung has produced. Um, and definitely one of the bigger concerns that everyone has mentioned here this evening is the buffer zones and the, the landscaping and everything like that. Um, and I can honestly believe that um, the projects that Sky Power are offering to develop have got to be one of the best, um, especially to be developed, um, to prove to different towns and surrounding communities that if, they're, if the projects are developed correctly, um, can benefit and not affect property values or interfere um, with the natural landscapes. The two projects that they're looking at um, are approximately 4,000 feet back off of Unity Road. So unlike the, the one that is literally directly across from our road, there will be no non, it's completely non-invasive and totally out of everyone's public eye. Um, the natural buffers that will be there um, exist as they are today, because nothing will change that way. Um, and the closest house to those projects that are being offered is approximately about 2,600 feet from the closest residence of those two projects. Um, the bonus, the, another big bonus to those projects especially is um, it will keep all the solar, if you guys are looking to add more solar in the Kingston area, it will keep it all localized, meaning that all the update, upgraded poles and everything are there, which will limit the need to have to develop in new areas. So it will keep it all together. And I know that one of the big concerns was the amount of traffic and stuff on our roads. And putting those two projects in place um, would not even come close to the amount of um, traffic and disturbance on the road that we've lived through now. Um, being that it is um, the biggest, and I've seen it myself, the biggest traffic and um, disturbance on the road with, with uh, vehicles and stuff comes from moving from the six sites that they've had there. So I completely understand um, the resistance to add any more to that but I think the projects that they're offering would allow different towns and communities to really see how well, if it is developed properly, that setting them far back from the public eye and not having to worry about the buffer zones that aren't quite there on the ones that are directly along Unity Road now that everyone is seeing and upset about, um, these, would never be these would never be in anyone's public eye other than by air. So. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Seeing no questions, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and our final uh, delegation this evening is uh, Mr. George Sutherland, the committee chair of the Rural Advisors Committee. Yeah. 
affirmation. Your <clears throat> uh, Worship, members of council, um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, seemed to have a quite a bit shorter meeting than we had last week. Uh, it was a full five hours and would have been longer if we hadn't had Saturn Power uh, pull their submission because it was a lot of angry residents for that one. I'm going to be brief. Uh, when you get into each project, Rural Affairs have uh, delineated their reasons at the time. We were all tired. It was approaching 11 o'clock. Um, we did the best we could. I think they're, the overall uh, point that I want to bring to Council is that uh, I want to take you back four, a little better than four years. And I was on Rural Affairs then, chairing the committee, and Samsung come in, and uh, we had no guidelines, and we were told we had no say. And city staff said, yes, we can set some guidelines only on site plans. So we helped set those guidelines. And it was really an objection to Samsung at the time, because I was at the public meeting one, where there was some res residents bringing issues up, and Samsung said, we do not have to listen to you. And I think that set the tone for a lot of people. And uh, I think the, the province took us our advice. It was recommended to council. Council adopt the guidelines. But I think uh, now that we have this massive uh, development out in the west on Unity Road, any members of council that drive out there, it, it is massive. And, you know, green energy is nice, but there's no reason for it to be quite so uh, massive, built along all the roads. And I think in the projects that were presented to us, there's some, when you're considering them tonight, some of them are built along roads and even the buffering won't work just due to topography and, uh, and why they have to build them all along the roads, I don't understand. I think the real benefit to this city is to put it on the rough land, land that isn't uh, producing much, but do we have to build them all on the roads? And I think if you look at the recommendations, Rural Affairs is going to look at site plan guidelines again and how they're working because we have some that aren't working at all. Now, some of that I think they got through before and approved before we put our guidelines in place, but we're going to look at that um, and hopefully improve those guidelines. Um, but there's only so much to do uh, you can do with guidelines when, uh, when uh, some of these projects are, are miles along the road and they want to build right up to them. Uh, the only other thing I would say, and it's a little bit out of line, is uh, we were tired when we reviewed all these applications, but Sky Power, uh, I will say that we had no objections to Sky Power. It was infill, and when you look at the big map for all the solar projects out in the west, I mean, it, it seems to fill right in if you have put all the other ones in there uh, when, when staff show you this in their part. Um, and so that's only the biggest concern, but they really did their homework with the residents and seemed to step back and, and made their uh, project less obtrusive, even though we didn't support it. Uh, Councillor Allen? I'm okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Are there any Maybe questions for uh, Mr. Sutherland? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Okay, so that is the... Uh, all of the delegations that we have this evening. Uh, we will have a staff briefing shortly. Um, petitions, there is the one petition that's noted in the agenda, but that referred to a solar project that was withdrawn. Are there any other petitions to present? Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I have um, some additional names to add to this uh, this petition. So it's um, in addition to the petition you've already presented, uh, I have 64 new names to add to that petition. So, uh, and that is here and served. And this is to um, petition number one? That's right, which is, so this is to petition number one, which um, was in regards to the Saturn power uh, proposal, which has been which withdrawn. Has been withdrawn. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other petitions, um, we will move on. So, we have...
no motions of congratulations. We have no deferred motions. So I will ask then for report number 80 from the Rural Advisory Committee. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we have a briefing that we added on the uh, added. So document. we're going to do that before we receive the report? Yeah. Yes. Briefing. Commissioner Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, members of council, members of the public. Uh, the briefing will be brief. You've already heard a lot of information tonight. Um, but I wanted to make sure that you had a little bit of information in terms of the background uh, of this process and specifically the process that staff actually followed through. And I recognize that what you have in front of you tonight are actually recommendations from the Rural Advisory Committee. But I, I think it might be helpful to give you a little bit of that information, especially for those members that are not uh, members of the Rural Advisory Committees. So as you all know, this is a provincial process. and. The municipal uh, resolution that the proponents are seeking is part of a process which will, they, through which they will gain points in terms of their submission to the province. The final decision obviously is not being made tonight in terms of whether or not a contract will be awarded that will be uh, made by the province. So even though this council may not or may support uh, a proponent, it doesn't mean that uh, the province will make the same decision. So the decision at the end of the day could be different than what uh, council uh, decides tonight. So I just want to make sure that was clear, that there wasn't a sense that this was a final uh, decision in terms of award of contract. As it was presented earlier, or discussed earlier, there, there is actually a total of 140 megawatt that's gonna be allocated throughout the province. And to give you an idea, in Kingston alone, the proposals you have in front of you tonight total 153.5 megawatt. So assuming that we were the only ones in the province that were looking at, at solar projects, we would be exceeding the, uh, the provincial allocation for the round one. So I, I just wanted to make sure that uh, councillors were also aware of that. The electricity produced as well will be distributed across Ontario and possibly across or outside of the province, I should add. So it's, it contributes to, um, to cleaner uh, energy overall, but it's not necessarily staying in the community because I, I've had some questions about that and I want to make sure I clarified that. In terms of process that we followed, we looked at, um, we did take into consideration the public feedback. We also took into consideration the economic development component of this, and we recognize that from a construction perspective and capital, it is a significant uh, investment uh, for these projects to come into our city. But one of the things we also wanted to make sure is we looked at the partnerships that we wanted to set with these uh, companies. And in order to try to establish that, we required that four agreements be entered into, and those agreements are, are landscape, landscaping site design guidelines which provide for buffers um, and also uh, mitigation measures in terms of screening. We also had the cost recovery agreement which allows a municipality to charge back for any cost incurred to negotiate these, uh, these agreements and to negotiate these proposals. We had the road use agreement, which speaks to the condition of the road, so if any repairs are required, uh, ditches as well, and um, decommissioning is also part of that. It also includes securities, which have to be provided throughout the process. And we have the Community Vibrancy Fund, which is a contribution that uh, is to be redirected to projects within the community. Now, we spoke earlier, there were presentations earlier about uh, a contribution of uh, 2,700 per megawatt. That's what the majority of them are. There is one company that is proposing to offer more than that, 3,500 per megawatt. That's per year. And all of these agreements are also in line with the ones that we've established with the Samsung project. So the Samsung project was the first one that actually had to go through uh, the process of these agreements being established. So when we prepared our reports to the Rural Advisory Committee, we looked at the information that we had received at that time, and we did uh, provide all proponents with the same timelines. Uh, we provided them with the same information, the same agreements, so we have been consistent throughout the process. 
and we based our recommendation in part uh, on the information that we had received. So some of the proponents had not submitted the ag sign agreements, and in that case, from a staff perspective, we felt that we could not recommend those projects because we wanted to make sure that we were engaging into a partnership with a partner that was willing to collaborate with us and we didn't have the information at that time. These recommendations, of course, have been discussed at length at the Rural, Rural Advisory Committee. And what you have in front of you, I think, is, is a result of a combination of the staff input and also the public input. And I think, Mr. Mayor, I will leave it at that for now, and I just want to provide that background. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councillor Neal. Yes, thank you for your briefing, and thanks for meeting yesterday and answering some questions, which I will pose again, just so they're on the public record. Um, it's my understanding that all of the proponents that are in front of us tonight have indeed signed all of those agreements at this time and we have signed copies and they went into the uh, Rural Advisory Committee meeting with those documents signed. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, all documents are currently signed, so they have been signed. Um, some did submit them before the Rural Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, there was one proponent that did bring them at the committee meeting, so we did receive them, but of course, when we prepared our reports and recommendation ahead of time, we didn't necessarily have those documents. And, and as I understand it, regardless of our decision and our recommendations, any of the proponents in front of us tonight that get accepted by the province, those are all enforceable agreements for the city. Is that accurate? For you, Mr. Mayor, that's correct, and that's part of the reason why we wanted to make sure these agreements were established ahead of a decision being made so that if these proponents were successful in obtaining a contract from the province, then we would already have those and, agreements in place to protect public And at, that's, at this time, that, that, is the, that criteria has been met because this is the decision-making making body for that. Through you, Mr. Mayor, the decision-making body is actually the province in terms of award yeah. of contract. But, but yes, the recommendation the... Uh, is up to council. Correct, in terms yeah. of uh, resolution of support. Good. Um, and have all of the uh, proponents also been made aware of our uh, of our uh, reforestation policy of our our bylaw, our tree bylaw? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, we have provided information to uh, the proponents. We've had uh, conversations with some of them in terms of these requirements of the tree bylaw. Uh, not all proponents have uh, chosen to uh, meet and discuss uh, with, uh, with us in terms of the requirements, but we have provided the same information to all proponents, and, so yes. And that's enforceable, of course, as well. Um, Lastly, I guess, um, I, I just want to make a comment. I appreciate the so, first. Questions only, Councilman. Questions only. I you'll will have maintain. A chance, you'll have a chance to make all the comments in the I world. Will, and, and just, I will just definitely few, do that. Just a few Thank minutes. you very much. I tried to sneak one in, but that's okay. Uh, other, other questions? Uh, Councilor Shell was next on my list. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Could you um, let us know what the difference is now from when Samsung got their permissions to what would happen today in terms of setbacks, buffering, and how the city could mitigate if the developer didn't follow through? Through you, Mr. Mayor. So Samsung, in terms of the approval process and the municipal input was was quite different than what we're going through right now. Uh, Samsung did have to sign our agreement, so they were the, the first project, if you wish, uh, that had to sign those agreements. We do hold some securities in terms of the site plan, so we've had some complaints, for example, with, uh, from some of the residents, and um, we've actually been in touch with the company to make sure that they're remediated, and if they don't actually follow through, we do hold securities where we can actually go ahead and, and do the work ourselves. Ideally, we would prefer not to have to do that, but it's an option that we have. 
Thank you. That This is my follow-up to that. When you have said securities, I wondered how that works. Is this that they have insurance policies, or do we actually have cash that we could use up? What, how does that process work? Who would like if to, I'm uh, <laughs> to take that question? Sue Sabio. Through, through your worship, um, we do take um, letters of credit. Um, we do, through uh, the road use agreements, have securities uh, with regards to uh, the removal of, tr removal of trees and landscaping. We also hold security as well, securities as well, and that is also in the form of a letter of credit. Councillor Allen. Um, thank you. Uh, Ms. Hurdle for uh, sharing um, your briefing with us. I, uh, w in terms of these agreements, um, do we include provisions in these agreements for 20 years from now uh, when these land leases um, end and uh, the, the agreements end and the contract ends? What happens uh, should uh, the, uh, I mean, the, some of these companies uh, uh, seem to be very stable, but should they not be 20 years from now and not be around? Uh, what security do we have in terms of uh, site mitigation or uh, decommissioning of these uh, projects from our end? What protections do we have? Through you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I know that the province actually has a, um, they require a uh, plan for decommissioning of of any uh, proponents that are successful in, in getting a contract. But we also have in the road use agreement some language around the commissioning and we also require securities along the way throughout the project that we hold back so that if there were issues where, for example, a company wasn't following through on their plan, we would have access to those security and be able to proceed with some remediation. Um, I have a question. Um, what is the value to a proponent of having a municipal resolution of support? In other words, uh, do they get a certain number of points? Is there some advantage to proponents that do have a municipal support resolution versus those that do not? That's a very good question, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, it is based on a point system. So the, the proponents that do get a resolution of support will obviously be able to acquire those points, but there are a number of other factors that are also taken into consideration by the province. I do not have all that information in terms of what all of those factors are and how the point system is set up, but there are other um, factors into consideration. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, uh, Councillor Candy. Thank you, and through you, uh, I guess just a question as far as uh, support goes. If if everybody's met all the requirements, legal requirements, and so on, and these are on private property, how is it that we don't support uh, some and support others if they're all if all the requirements have been met? Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, when we prepared our staff report uh, at the time, staff were recommending three projects. And that was based on the information we had received in terms of the sign agreements. So the ones that we did not recommend, we did not have all the agreements signed at the time of preparation of the reports. So that, that's why we, from a staff perspective, recommended three. One of them actually uh, withdrew from the process and the other two went through the Rural Advisory Committee. Okay, seeing no more questions, thank you very much. Thank you. So with that, I will ask for report number 80 from the Rural Advisory Committee. Um, so it's my pleasure to submit report number 80 from the uh, Rural Advisory Committee that it be received and adopted. Moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Bohm, that report number 80 from the Rural Advisory Committee be received and adopted. Okay, so there are seven clauses, so we're going to move through this clause by clause, um, just so that Council understands this process. Um, this is a very prescriptive yes or no 
So you will see that there is a recommendation from the Rural Advisory Committee for each project. So what we will do is we will debate each project, then we will call the vote. If the vote passes, then we confirm the motion that has been recommended to us by the Rural Advisory Committee. If that fails, then there will be an opportunity for Council to put the reverse motion forward. So for example, looking at number one, if this motion was to fail, which is essentially a motion saying not to the grant uh, support resolution, then there's an opportunity for Council to put forward a resolution that would um, grant that resolution. Okay, so we will move to number one. Number one is request for municipal council support under the large renewable procurement Cataraqui Ridge Solar LP. Councillor Neal. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I sincerely hope that we vote against um, the, this recommendation and I'll, I'll explain briefly why. Um, this proposal, as I understand it, and staff can correct me if I'm wrong, was initially recommend on the recommended list. Uh, it turned out that, as we saw in an email uh, from the proponent, staff uh, from the proponent, uh, there was an oversight and there was one signature missing in the materials that had been donated, that had been submitted. That had been corrected, that oversight, by the 18th. And so, so, in fact, all of the documents are now signed as they are with all of these proposals. Um, I just want to say if missing, being late on a signature or uh, something that's expected is terminal, God forbid, because I wouldn't have three degrees in 28 years as a public educator if uh, I was eliminated because of a late submission. Uh, so I sincerely hope that we can look at these, at the merits of the projects, and not judge them as not being suitable because a signature that's now there and a commitment that's now there uh, is enforceable and has been, indeed been submitted. Uh, this, this is a project and we heard today that they're quite willing, uh, having heard some of the input about uh, si significant woodland and uh, needing an adequate uh, buffer from significant wetland, all of those issues, they're quite willing to be part of the proposal. And they're comfortable in making those mitigating statements. For, for anybody who hasn't been out McAdoo's Lane lately, what this is right now is an active uh, heavy industrial junkyard in, in large portion. What would be replaced is a steady income, uh, passive industrial site. That's an improvement for the community. Uh, they have had all but one, as I understand it, abutting neighbors sign off on the property. Uh, and it was initially recommended except for the one missing. Uh, the one missing uh, signature. So I sincerely hope that uh, we turn the recommendation down on this one and we do the appropriate thing. Quite frankly, if we only vote for one project and we only support one of the five, and it just so happens to be city property that's going to generate substantial income to the city, and we say no to every other one of these, then I think we're gonna make a mockery of us making any claim to sustainability, let alone being 
Canada's most sustainable city. So we need to step up and support the ones that are sensibly before us. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Turner. Thank you, and through you, uh, Mayor, I completely agree with Mr. Neal. Wow, that was awesome. Um, I think we need to cut red tape, and I think we should vote against this and vote to allow this proposal. Thank you, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Councillor Allen. Um, thank you. Uh, just to give you a bit of sense uh, where the advice from the Rural Advisory Committee comes from is uh, that there were concerns around the wetlands and, and, and the woodlands, and it, 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 it was great to see some changes between uh, the original uh, proposal and now in terms of making uh, that a, be a better proposal for everyone. I, um, one of the big things when we're considering these uh, and the rest of these today, I, I, I'd submit that Kingston is, we're doing okay in terms of renewable energy. We have some great windmills. Uh, they're not in our municipality, but we look at them every day, so they're part of the makeup of our life. Uh, we have the largest solar array um, in uh, Ontario, for sure, and probably in Canada. And we, we have been growing. Um, and I think some of the concerns that came out of the meeting and from the public were, well, how much is too much? What does that look like? Is it distributed across the region? Do we know where that, that plan is? And, and what do we want for the rural area of our city? Um, what do we want that to, asset to be? Do we want people to be able to move there, build their house, commute to the university or the hospital or whatever and have a nice lifestyle that is an asset to our city? Is that part of what we want to do? And so we need to consider that when we consider all of these. And, and obviously we're not going to be, have a defined vision of that tonight, but it's something I would just put in the back of your minds. Um, th this one is on industrial land, and the only uh, uh, real issue I have with it is, uh, w uh, do we anticipate large-scale, heavy industrial moving to Kingston, and where will it go if our heavy industrial lands is taken up by solar panels? Um, one of the issues that uh, residents of the rural area share is uh, that we feel like we get things that nobody else wants. And, and that would be, I mean, obviously, uh, it would be difficult to build a, a solar farm down on uh, the old prison farm site or Lemoyne Point or something, but, like, nobody's proposing that. And nobody, nobody here would, would accept that. But um, you have to understand that you know, we feel we've gotten all we get all the industrial uses that people don't want. We have to deal with uh, certain types of uh, operations that are different than in the city, and we just want to make sure that it's considered and that we're considered as residents of the city, building a whole city together. Um, I supported this at the rural advisory committee. Uh, I was uh, my colleagues did not, and. Uh, Generally, for the reasons that uh, Councillor Neal shared, uh, most of it was there, um, uh, and uh, and the the woodland was something that that, that came up, and and working with uh, the local recreational mountain biking people, and I think that can be figured out in the next stage of the process. So I'm, as a member of the committee, I'm okay if we turn this one around, um, because I I originally went there, and so. Uh, and I think that some of the co committee's concerns have been met in, um, in what the uh, representative has brought forward. Uh, so I will be supporting that as well. Thank you. Councillor Bowman. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. So I was one of the committee members that uh, originally turned this down. And having since seen the proponent's willingness to address uh, the major issues, which was the woodland and also mitigate other factors through site planning and everything, I will actually happily support turning 
this recommendation down and as Councillor Allen said, turning this one around because seeing the willingness to kind of pull that together in a short amount of time and, and redo this proposal to make it fit, I think that shows uh, good faith and uh, the, uh, hopefully a good partnership moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other speakers, we will call the vote. And again, just to remind everyone, if you are in favor of a resolution of this project, you will vote against this recommendation to allow for a positive recommendation to come forward. So called vote. And that loses by a vote of one to nine. So now uh, we will look for a motion to grant uh, a resolution of support. If I can have a mover, moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Bohm. Thank you. So the clerks have that. So essentially it will be of the same form that you will see on, on a couple of the other recommendations. Again, it's a very prescriptive motion. So seeing no further debate, we will call the vote. And that carries by a vote of nine to one. Okay, on to number two, request for municipal council support under the large renewable procurement sky power projects. Any comments from Council? Councillor Neal. I, having looked at this again and having heard, um, in fact, the chair saying that this was, uh, he felt was a, a, consi was a considerate application, um, I will be voting a little less passionately, but I'll be voting <laughs> Uh, against the recommendation because I think we should give Sky Power an opportunity. I do still have some reservations about us seemingly putting so much in one particular area of the city. But uh, I think it's a responsible application. And again, it's unfortunate that at the day, day of the committee, they showed up with the with the signed document, uh, but they are enforceable and they have been signed. So, so that's somewhat like me handing in an essay a day late and having it accepted, I think. So I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, we'll be able to consider this on the merits of the project. Thank you. Councilor Schell. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. This was a difficult one. Um, it became clear, at the, I went to the meeting, that um, what they showed as where the uh, solar panels will be cannot increase. They can decrease, but they can't increase. And Sky Power showed the solar panels at Unity Road stepped back. And then the other uh, panels would be um, at the very lower part, way, way away from Unity Road. Um, another thing that catches my attention is that we have a lot of landowners who are prepared to, to lease these properties to solar farms, which leads me to believe that they are more important or more financially viable as solar farms to the landowners uh, than um, agricultural. And I know we do have a lot of agricultural areas that really have not been very successful. Uh, in Eastern Ontario. We all learned that actually when we went to high school and did our geography about some of the very difficult topography in this area. Um, so I am inclined to uh, agree with, with Councillor Neal that we should um, not support this resolution and move ahead with allowing a sky power uh, project. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you. And just to, uh, again, uh, speak to the advice provided by the committee, uh, the, the concern that Councillor Neal had mentioned in, in terms of this, I think, was the ultimate deciding factor that um, 
at the committee, and that is that this was uh, a lot of um, a lot for that neighborhood. Um, it, it, we have the, there's 100 megawatts in the Samsung project. There's 140 available province-wide in this competition. So, like, if that gives you a sense of, like, the scale of the Samsung project and the impact it's had on that community, um, that it, it's, it's been very difficult and divided, obviously, as we, we learned tonight, there are supportive voices that still in that community who are looking forward to and happy to have that. So, I, I share uh, Councillor Shell's um, uh, splitness on this app, but I'm going to remain uh, on the side of the committee in terms of the concerns around the density and the amount of impact on the community. Councillor Bone. Yeah, just to echo Councillor Allen's words on this one, I think this area in particular is suffering, suffering solar fatigue at this point. It's just been constant construction. It was massive projects and I would say in the future these are areas that are likely to be developed, but it begs the question how much is too much and too soon in a certain area? And although it looks logical on the map, you can really look at it and say, if the people that are living there have been dealing for that construction for the last five, six years, and then there's another two years kind of on top of that, on top of all the other issues, it just gets to the point where we, I think, as Councillor Allen mentioned earlier, we really need to have a conversation of infill, how much is too much, is this going to be an industrialized area, do we all want them in one spot or do we want them spread out? So I'm going to uh, uh, stick with the recommendation from the Rural Affairs Committee on this one. Thank you. So uh, Deputy Mayor Stroud is not here, so I'm going to look to the previous Deputy Mayor, Councillor Holland. Will you take the chair? I will, and I recognize you. Thank you. Uh, I don't think there's any question that we're trying to strike an appropriate balance here. We're trying to be receptive to the concerns of the neighborhood, but at the same time send a signal that we are very much open and willing to, uh, to host solar power, to be very open to green energy. The question is, how do we best send that signal? And I think that Councillor Neal said it very well earlier that if we reject all of these proposals, we're certainly sending one signal. But if we approve all of them, we're sending a different signal. And perhaps the signal that we need to be sending to really be able to create that balance is to approve projects where the density is not a concern, as we did with the previous project, but to legitimize the concerns that have been put forward by our rural councillors, by the Rural Advisory Committee, that suggest that density is a real concern here. And so because of quality of life concerns, that we do want to be able to recognize that input. So this is an occasion where I'm going to uh, take the input from the councillors that are most impacted by this and certainly by the committee as well. And I think that this is exactly the kind of signal that we want to send. You know, that there was a time, as we've talked about, where green energy just went wherever it was going to go and there was absolutely no municipal input whatsoever. And now we've been granted that opportunity to provide that municipal input, so I think we need to use it wisely. And so I think this is an opportunity where we can stand and we can say we are in favor of green energy, but only to a certain point and only in certain degrees. So I will uh, support the recommendation of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, and I return the chair. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Okay, so we will call the vote on the recommendation Please vote. And that carries by a vote of seven to three. Number three, a request for municipal council support under the large renewable procurement. Um, and I noticed that there was something in the ad is here. It's uh, Kingston East Solar Energy Partnership. Councillor Neal. Just very quickly, I am so relieved to be able to support the recommendation that's, that's before us. Um, and just to reiterate, it would have been really awkward if we had only approved our own uh, uh, pro project. And uh, so leasing this 
uh, bringing forward what we've all been trying to find, which is non-tax revenue for the city, uh, this is, I think, a sensible and a good project to support. So I will be supporting the recommendation of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Uh, just, just to say it on, on the record and through you, Mr. Chair, the um, uh, the, the committee uh, felt, uh, and and the committee again has doesn't really have the interest of the corporation of the city in mind. They have the, the interest of the rural area in mind. They're they're residents from the rural area who have volunteered their time to be part of the committee, and so I'm not sure that that um, lease income was part of their recommendation there or part of thinking about it for in other perspectives. They mostly were thinking about the fact that it's already screened. It's on land that we can't do much else with. Um, and there's not a lot of neighbors. And I was at the public meeting and there were a few abutting neighbors there and they were, uh, they, they thought it was a great idea and uh, there was a reasonable setbacks and everything looked in line for them uh, in terms of the proposal. So it, um, it is, uh, it, this one was an easy one for, for, for the committee, and, and I think it's an easy one for us to, to support. And I just, uh, I just want to, to make it clear that I don't think they really had the interest of the corporation of the city and Kingston in mind. They had the interest of the community in mind when they chose that. Okay, so we will call the vote. Again, this is a positive recommendation. So if you support this, then you would vote yes. Please vote. And that carries unanimously. Number four. So request for municipal council support under the large renewable procurement, bond field, NCC, solar LP2, Kingston Sun Solar. Any comments or questions? Councillor Neal. I keep waiting to go second, but I never get the opportunity. Uh, I um, am going to suggest that we vote no. I just want to remind members of the, uh, that this was one of the two that was recommended by staff. Um, it failed by a 4-4 vote at the committee. And so, I think that there's good reasons to support this. I appreciated the presentation that we heard today and the concern for uh, making environmental mitigation part of their their policy. Uh, their setbacks, I think, are are quite substantial and and considerate of the community. So I, I sincerely hope that we can say no, so we can say yes to this proposal. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can I see you for a minute? So just, just to clarify for council, because, because number four lost on a tie, it comes to council without a recommendation. So if you're in favor of this one, you will vote yes. If you're against it, you will vote no. So Thank just, you, listen to the mayor, don't so listen to me. Just just to clarify, so Councillor Neal doesn't accidentally defeat the very project that he wants to see go forward. Councillor Bolton. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, and as, as Councillor Neal uh, alluded to, it was actually, a, it lost on a 3-3 tie. Um, so this was something that the committee was, was split on, and personally, I voted in favor of it, and I think that I'm going to vote again in favor of it. And the reason is, is because I think the message that I would like to be sent is when developers come to Kingston, don't just come, you know, looking for kind of solar. Like, how else can you enhance the vibrancy of our, commuter, our, of our community? So how are you thinking outside the box? When you look at species at risk, when you look at other uses of the site, I think that that sends a really good message. And I think that that type of development is exactly what we want to encourage as a sustainable city. So when a developer comes with that proposal, um, I really do want to kind of embrace that and see, see where we can go with it. Um, I, I do realize there are some concerns about some of the trails in the area, 
And I really believe that those can be mitigated uh, through this site plan and uh, developing in good faith and realizing that we, you know, those trails are, especially the Rideau and the, and the K&P in the area, they're, they're part of what council's identified as some of our priorities as well. So I think that's something that I'd really uh, rely on staff to work out with uh, the proponent and uh, I'll happily be endorsing this one. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else that wishes to speak? Okay, so we will call the vote. Number four. And that carries by a vote of eight to two. Number five is a request for municipal council support under the large renewable procurement Corduke Solar LP. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so I had expressed my concerns about, uh, well, residents' concerns with the proliferation of solar farms in the area um, during the delegation and the presentation. And I, I, I feel that of all of the proponents, um, this one has demonstrated in, in a number of ways that that is a, that there is some, um, that they take it seriously, that they're investing in the community and that they, with the vibrancy fund, that we will see um, payoff to match the, uh, some of the, the um, more distur disturbing, I suppose, uh, area, parts of the development. Um, I think in terms of the location, it's, again, there are the concerns about the, the density in the area, but um, my feeling in, the, in this case is that there wouldn't be quite as much disruption on Unity Road, and therefore I am supporting this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else that wishes to speak? So I will, oh, Councillor Allen. Thank you. Um, okay, so I, I didn't speak to the last one primarily because I wanted you had all the information the Rural Advisory Committee had, and it was a split, so I wanted, I didn't want to influence your considerations there. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll just mention what the um, Rural Advisory Committee considered here, and it was the density uh, uh, primarily, and, and there was concerns with the trees. So if you're looking at the, at, at the bullet points up there, that pretty much covers it, and it, it, there are already, there's already an existing solar farm across uh, Westbrook Road from this um, this proposal and uh, so we would be filling that area in and it, that area is quite close to our urban boundary as well and we might want to consider um, before we do too much infill there what that looks like for the future of our city and, and what, what our residents are doing are we going to put trails or other types of things there that our citizens can ask so I think um, uh, I think that y you get the gist of where the committee is coming from, and I'll be supporting the committee's recommendation again on this. Okay, thank you. So we will call the vote. So again, a yes vote is to confirm the committee's recommendation. A no vote would be to overturn it. Okay, so that loses on a tie. Mr. Clerk, can I see you for a moment? Okay, so I was just conferring with the clerk. Um, so what we're gonna do is, I'm going to look for a mover and seconder to put forward the positive motion, and we will see what happens. If that loses on a tie, then no resolution will be granted. Effectively, we were unable to make a decision, and so we can't grant that resolution. So, um, 
So we will, but we will allow for a positive motion to be presented if there's a mover and seconder for it. Moved by Councillor Turner. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Osanic. Okay, so this would be to put forward a positive motion. So this would be to grant a, uh, a motion of support for this proposal. So we will call the vote. Please vote. And that carries by a vote of six to four. Okay, on to number six. A request for municipal council support under the large renewable procurement Battersea Solar LP. Any questions or comments? Councillor Allen. Um, we didn't uh, hear a presentation about this one tonight, um, but uh, this one is um, also by the Next Era Energy folks, and uh, it's really just north of the 401 um, along Montreal Street, and uh, it's uh, on the right-hand side right before you get to Edenwood States. And it, uh, would back right onto several properties uh, of Edenwood Estates and actually cut into the woods of Edenwood. Uh, there was um, uh, some, some concerns about setbacks and buffering, but even in the uh, diagrams that, the, that they showed us uh, at the Rural Advisory Committee, it looked like the end result of their project once they imposed our um, our municipal setbacks would be very small and, and possibly not even viable. So I'm, I think that's why we didn't uh, hear an appeal for, for more endorsement. Uh, I think uh, this one is very close to a residential area and, it, it, and the most dense area of, of residences uh, of all of the um, proposals today. Okay, um, Councillor Holland, will you take the chair? I will, and I recognize you. Thank you. I just want to confirm what Councillor Allen has said. Uh, in my view, this is not uh, an appropriate location for a solar project. And again, if we come back to my earlier comments about trying to send the right signal, I think this is exactly the sort of proposal that we should be voting against. Thank you very much. Thank you. I return the chair. So with that. We will call the vote. And that carries by a vote of nine to one. Okay, item number seven. So it means it loses. So just, just so everyone knows. Okay, so number seven. Uh, <laughs> right, number seven, a large renewable procurement process staff directions. Is there any comments or questions on this? Seeing none, call the vote. And that carries. Okay, nothing from Committee of the Whole. We do have one information report uh, noted in the added. So are there any questions about that report? Seeing none, we have uh, no miscellaneous business, no new motions, any notices of motion. Okay, no minutes, tabling of documents, communications, a number of those listed. Is there any other business? Seeing none. We'll ask for bylaws. Not yet. Moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Bohm, that bylaw one be given its first and second reading. Please vote. It's 
Still one person to vote. And that carries. Moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Neal, that bylaw one be given its third reading. Please vote. And that carries. Motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Bohm, seconded by Councillor Candon. Please vote. And that carries. Thank you very much.